To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. The cycle of life on planet Earth follows an invisible, orderly timetable. Under ordinary circumstances, this cycle replenishes and renews itself in its own time and on its own steam. Until man destroys it all by interfering with the order of things. At the hands of man, the Sumatran rhinoceros has become the most critically endangered mammalian species in the world. For years, it has been a victim of the lethal poaching trade in its prized horns, which carry a price tag of up to 60,000 US dollars per kilo. With traditional beliefs in their alleged medicinal properties fueling the trade in body parts, poachers risk life and limb to hunt down rhinos for their horns. Destruction of its natural habitat due to logging, the conversion of land to agricultural use, and the opening up of forests and road building projects have also contributed to the alarming decrease in its numbers. Worldwide estimates put the Sumatran rhino at a mere 300 animals left in the wild today. The smallest of the Asian rhino species, the Sumatran rhino, is also the only Asian rhino species with two horns. The species has been on the IUCN endangered list since 1960. In 1996, its status was downgraded to critically endangered, and there it remains today. This is the story of how a group of volunteer green detectives from Singapore answered the call for help in the conservation program of the Sumatran rhinos. The program is led by the Singapore Zoological Gardens in partnership with SOS Rhino and the Singapore International Foundation. The volunteers are a group of students from Tomasic Polytechnic who have taken it upon themselves to work for this worthy cause. <laughs> We were actually roped in by Singapore International Foundation and Singapore Zoo, okay, which formed, which actually initiated this project. So they were looking for a local organization to uh, gather a group of volunteers to go over to Sabah, okay, to Tabin Wala Reserve for a project which is known as Youth Expedition Project, which will be funded by SIF. With resources from SIF, expert advice and training from the zoo, TP students participated in the first rhino expedition organized in November 2001. Their destination was the Tabin Wildlife Reserve, situated 50 kilometers northeast of Lahad Datu on the Dent Peninsula in Sabah. It occupies an area of 1,205 square kilometers, more than 1.5 times the size of Singapore. It was here that the elusive Sumatran rhino was reportedly last sighted in 1999. This shy animal is the smallest of all the rhino species and the only rhino species with hair covering its body. In an ecologically balanced environment, the Sumatran rhino is only one of many species living side by side a diverse range of flora and fauna. Found within this forest sanctuary are Asian elephants, close to 220 species of birds and primates. But the volunteers were not in Tabin for an ecotourism camp. They were there for a more critical project, to gather data on the Sumatran rhino, data that would help in demographic studies and future plans to save the species. Tabin is an area of virgin tropical rainforest. The terrain is rugged, primitive and hilly. The weather is unpredictable and can result in any combination of rain, sunshine and humidity at any time. The forest is home to a myriad of insects and other small animals and the damp undergrowth is paradise to the colony of leeches. Under these challenging conditions in surroundings totally alien, the volunteers mission was to track down and record all evidence of rhino activity from the most evident, like an obvious footprint, to the most elusive, like the bite marks on a leaf. In spite of the unfriendly environment, the first expedition yielded promising results. Evidence indicating the presence of at least eight rhinos was recorded. 
Of the eight, the evidence showed the presence of a mother and a calf. This was encouraging news. For Sumatran rhinos are known to be solitary animals and do not come together except to procreate. The presence of the calf is a positive sign that raises hope for the survival of the Sumatran rhinos. The data collected on the first expedition allowed conservationists to begin plotting the distribution of the Sumatran rhinos in Sabah. This meant that they could begin to track the animal's population and learn more about its movements within the reserve. Encouraged by what they found, a second expedition was proposed in order to continue the work. When plans were made for the second expedition to take place in May this year, another batch of Tomasic Poly students had volunteered to go in search of the Sumatran rhino, or at least for evidence of them. Once again, Kyle was responsible for toughening up the new volunteers. That is the biggest challenge that that I face um, when I when I got to know about the nature and the environment of this project. And I told myself that I need at least two months for the first project and double when it comes to the second project because we have decided to go to at least kilometer 17. We drew up a program and we, we decided that we must train all these student volunteers okay, so that they are fit physically and mentally to at least cover uh, about 20 kilometer of, of you know, walk, flat ground walk in Singapore. So that's the reason why we embark on our two and a half months, okay, close to three months long of physical training. Because that is the minimum criteria. If you're not fit to walk, then the rest you can forget about it. You don't get to the pro point where you're supposed to go, then there's no point going. Preparing them physically and mentally was the biggest headache, but the biggest challenge as well. 19-year-old Nu Maria Samantha, a tourism diploma student, volunteered to go for the second time. We prepared like months, about three months before we go. And we had like um, three times a week. So we ran around the Bedok Reservoir about two times, but as progressively we go more than four, about four rounds. Uh, because we come from different majors and causes. So we need to get to know each other first before we go for the trip. While Kyle and Maria took care of the physical preparation, the expert training on jungle survival and rhino tracking was left up to Tan Kit Sun, conservation curator with the Singapore Zoo. The seriousness of the expedition became increasingly clear as Kit Sun drummed in a simple fact. The volunteers were entering a domain where wildlife was in charge and the laws of the jungle were to be respected. They were thoroughly trained in every aspect, including medical emergencies. For every YEP trip, okay, you must have at least two CPR trained and first aid trained personnel. Okay, and there are three facilitators on this trip and one volunteers. Okay, the four of us are adults, so we are trained in first aid as well. So uh, the bare minimum that we I, I prepared the team for is that at least the facilitator will know what to do okay, to tackle issues such as, such as fever, which they have encountered, cuts, you know, stings. And we even went to the Singapore Zoo for a uh, one-day training on how to handle snakes bite. Okay, and uh, of course, we carry our satellite phone. In, in the end, we need to do evacuation. The means are always there to help you cover. With the team in place and basic training provided in jungle survival skills, the volunteers and the expedition leaders got ready to embark on their trip. For the first time volunteers, this meant a journey into unknown territory. Passers-by and counter-stop at Changi, the excitement of a group of students checking in seemed typical of any overseas study expedition. If anyone had asked, deputy student leader Stephen Tan, pursuing his graduate diploma in chemical engineering, would have gladly shared their mission objective. This was a journey unlike any other. It was the first step in a journey that could help save a critically endangered species. Yeah, I think most of us 
started with zero knowledge about rhino and actually there's such a species known as, as the Sumatran rhino but I think from all the trainings now um, we roughly know what we're going to do there is more of like finding out uh, how the rhinos survival in, in Tabin itself. Kyle, Maria and their teammates wasted no time when they arrived in Kota Kinabalu. In time for the celebration of the Harvest Festival, they acted quickly to set in motion a public awareness program. For the people of Sabah, living off the land is second nature. By bringing the plight of the Sumatran rhino to their attention, <coughs> Kyle and his team succeeded in increasing their awareness of this majestic animal living in their midst. In the long run, it is hoped that the local population will also become partners in future rhino conservation programs. Harvest Festival is actually an uh, annual event that uh, is quite a big event in Sabah itself. Primarily, they are there to celebrate the harvest of the previous year. During the Harvest Festival, you have people from the whole of Sabah, even people from Sarawak coming over, okay, and a lot of tourists will visit that place. So after discussion during a reconnaissance trip with our partners from SOS Rhino Singapore Zoo and SIF, we feel that that is a good avenue for us to spread the message of conserving the Sumatran Rhino. So we decided to go in to participate okay, by putting out an informative uh, booth exhibition okay, with a colouring competition, I mean in charge by the student, to spread the message why you should conserve the Sumatran Rhino Okay, because there aren't that many left in the world, especially in Sabah, and furthermore, it's the heritage of the Sabahan themselves. After two days in Kota Kinabalu, it was time to head for the reserve. It's like uh, it, the, the rhino shed itself, where the rhino last time used to sleep. Uh, so it's like they built plank wood, they just sleep on the plank. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, but got shelter. And the kitchen is just outside the city place. Uh, the kitchen actually last time the rider used to um, bathe over there. Completely unfazed by the sparseness of their environment at the Tabin headquarters, the volunteers went to work. This meant building everything from scratch and making do with whatever materials they had brought or could find around them. The training received prior to the trip had prepared them well. Without giving it a second thought, the volunteers worked together as a team and plunged right in to take care of the work at hand. I think that everybody has a responsibility to take care of their own health and well-being. Because if you don't, then you become a liabilities. Okay, and over above that, you must act towards the team objective, which is to look out for each other. Okay, and I think all of them have done very well, although we have many, many encounters, like I give you an example, you won't know that you are scared of leech bite until you, you get bitten by one. Okay, you won't know that you are scared of funny insects or nutmegs or whatever you have inside down there until you encounter them. So periodically you hear people screaming, yeah, what is this? Okay, and ee, there's one leech on my legs. So I think these are all very brand new experiences students, or should I say the volunteers have gone through. And I think have served them well to let them know what they do not know. Yeah, so I think uh, all of us has, in one way or another, helped each other to, to bond the team together because it's not about one person getting to kilometer 22, take for instance. It's about whole team getting there. If one person to make it there, the whole team to make it there. So you either work for each other or we just have to stop. There's four groups under different leadership are supposed to do a rhino survey, uh, which means transact. Okay, and data collection at the same time at different places. Because, as you know, the animal move around. You see them here today, you don't see them here tomorrow. That night, after a final briefing, the group retired. Each member in their own quiet way, mentally prepared for the work and the challenges ahead. The group of 30 was divided into four different teams, each headed by a facilitator. For the expedition to succeed, it was imperative for each team to take a different route for the rhino survey. But before sending the volunteers off to do their work, Kyle and the facilitators had planned an orientation trek. This was to give the volunteers a taste of what the jungle had in store. 
During their trek, the volunteers were taught to keep a lookout for mud volcanoes. These were places where signs of rhino activity may be spotted. Mud volcanoes are the result of the Earth's underground thermal activity that causes minor eruptions of warm mud that bubbles to the surface. This mud is rich in minerals and is an important source of salt for animals. The Sumatran rhino is known to frequent mud volcanoes to lick for salt, which in turn helps keep its digestive system in shape. By keeping an eye out for mud volcanoes and the surroundings, the volunteers could hope to find evidence of the presence of a rhino in the area. The Tabin Wildlife Reserve boasts seven mud volcanoes, the biggest of which is twice the size of a football field and found right in the center of the forest area. The rhinos are also known to roll in the mud, creating mud wallows. These are essentially the rhino's mud baths. Wallowing in the mud helps a rhino to keep cool, keeps its skin in good condition, and the layer of mud also functions as an insect repellent. Once the orientation trek was over, the volunteers were all set for the real trek into the rainforest. Because the reserve covered such a huge area, it was imperative that the rhino survey was planned and executed systematically. This would prevent any wastage of data collected due to duplication. In the first expedition, primarily because it was the pioneer rhino survey and the study was just beginning, the volunteers trekked only up to kilometer seven base camp. For this second expedition, four stop points of base camps were identified and each team was assigned a different location to trek to. The base camps were located at 7, 17, 22 and 32 kilometers from the Tabin headquarters at the southwestern edge of the reserve. Once the camps were set up, the teams moved out and started their rhino survey. By having as many group cover as wide an area as possible, you effectively eliminate the chances of duplicates data. Each team, they are expected okay, with their, the two rangers that attach to each team okay, and one facilitator, there are about eight, nine to ten per team. Okay, they will first get to the place where they're supposed to go, set up base camp. And then a normal day will start with wake, early morning call. You wake up, do your breakfast and, and you probably have to set off by about eight okay, with your, your mobile lunch. Okay, and you just have to track about one to two kilometers to get away from your base camp because the animal will not come to the base camp. And to go and search for the, the hoof, which is the print, okay, is the hardest part because, uh, as you know, jungle have very thick undergrowth, especially secondary. Okay, and you have to clear all the leaves. Okay, I think in order just to reach the, the mud or the ground, you probably have to sit for a few seconds to clear away in the, the leaves. And hopefully that is a path the Sumatran I know has actually taken either the day before or the month before. Because this animal can be as heavy as a few hundred kilograms, so whenever they move around this softer terrain, they will leave a, a hoof or a print that is really deep. So uh, once you find this, first is please don't, don't move because you might be stepping and, and destroying some of the others that are around. Okay, uh, alert the ranger so they will come and and verify whether this is the one. Once it's verified, then the rest will start um, removing the leaves from the point of uh, identification, ho hopefully to find a series of the print, okay, and to, or to find other things such as wallow and, um, and dung as well. Observations and data collected in the course of the trek were recorded using the cyber tracker. As well as Rhino has this thing called a cyber tracker which is a customized program that is built for palm users. Okay, and they, they are all, uh, each team will have a visor okay, with a cyber, cyber tracker program on it. So you can key in when do you find this, how many print do you find, what is the width and the length of each print, and what is the distance between two, two prints, and how many prints you find. So once that is done, you lock on to the GPS and get a coordinate. Okay, so when you go back to your laptop, you will download all this data into the computer. Okay, so the computer will have a full map of Tabin Wala Reserve itself. So you are able to see what are the, the patterns of this animal. Is it the same animal moving at different, dif on different time of the year or months? So um, in so doing, they are able to determine. Okay, 
by coming up with estimate numbers of the number of animals that exist inside. Using satellites, the latest global positioning system technology in the Cyber Trekker allowed Kyle and the volunteers to pinpoint the exact coordinates of the locations where there was evidence of rhino activity. Upon returning to their respective base camps, the volunteers could also immediately upload the data into their laptops. With a Cyber Trekker, the activities of the rhino within the reserve could be seen clearly at one glance. Even as Kyle, Maria, the facilitators and the volunteers prepared to venture deep into the forest, the question on everyone's mind was whether the Sumatran rhinos were still present or if the passage of time had already driven them to extinction. Volunteers were hopeful, yet unsure of what they would find. For one thing, the Sumatran rhino is not known to make an appearance for the benefit of man, preferring to keep to areas where encounters with humans are minimal or non-existent. So there was little chance of any volunteer coming face to face with one of them. But the Sumatran rhino was still around in the reserve. This kept the volunteers going. They were not disappointed. They have actually found a whole series of new tracks with dung. Okay, and, and this made all of us very excited. And for Team 4, that went all the way up to the rugged ridge, which, which is about 1,000 meters high, okay, we even found a new set of tracks on top of the ridge itself. So um, we have gathered more data than the last trip, okay, that's for sure. Secondly, is that we have found them in places which we don't expect them to. And uh, by the fact that we are seeing such a big series with dung, so that means the signs are quite encouraging. If the data in any way showed that there was increased rhino activity by different rhinos in different parts of the reserve, it could mean that the number of animals living in the reserve might not be as low as eight, which was the number projected in the first expedition. Whatever information that can be gathered in Tabin goes towards the continuous study of the ecology, demographics and habits of the Sumatran rhino. This would subsequently allow conservationists to plan the best way to protect the species and ensure its survival. For Kyle, Maria and the volunteers who went on this trip, the elation of knowing they played a part in the bigger picture of protecting a critically endangered species is something that will remain with them long after the paper chase is gone. When the time comes, the call will go out for volunteers for a third expedition. It is hoped that many more young green detectives will sign up to help prevent this majestic animal from going down the route to extinction.